So today we move on uh, straight away into what is it that we are doing. So can this be solved at origin? This was a question that a lot of people uh, would ask, uh, cry, uh, get angry and stop at that. But then uh, we realized at some point uh, that it was a case where we cannot rely just on garments. We, really, we thought that we should take action. So, for example, this is a temple site. You see, it's in such a ruined condition. But this temple has some fantastic sculptures. This is again an uh, early Chola temple. Uh, these are the Koshta Murtis, the ones that we saw in the last session lining the swimming pools of the rich and the famous. So, the responsibility lies with us as well. So these, this temple was targeted by robbers. In fact, this particular bronze was targeted by thieves. Uh, in fact, they had taken photographs and sent it to the international market. So we worked with law enforcement. We went into the village. And the villagers responded. Uh, this was a temple that was built in 962, uh, the common era, by uh, the, the, the father of king, the great king, Raja Raja. And this is what happened after that. So the temple was spruced up. The deities were saved from being targeted. So yes, uh, local action is also required. We just can't blame the international market. Local people uh, uh, have to take on the task of uh, the responsibility of taking care. And that is our sacred duty. But this is not just a responsibility of the locals. India is such a wide and vast place where everywhere we go, we see, uh, you know, old ancient artifacts. And here, right there on your screen, I've been talking for about two sec, two minutes. You see, there is hidden in this construction. You can see there is a, a Jain Murti right there by the side of the well. And this is again a thousand year old artifact that is just lying there. Like that, we have a lot of such. This is a Buddha on a farm. This is a Buddha on the road. Uh, another Buddha right there. Uh, th all these are thousand year old sculptures. And India has literally thousands of such artifacts. You have hero stones. And if you go up north, for example, in Mount Abu, there are hundreds of such temple murtis. And most of them have been stolen. Now, it doesn't take great rocket science to know that this is a modern replacement. You can clearly see that it's been placed into the spot from there. The original was stolen. But unless people come forward and register the complaints, these motifs will be trafficked. So this is one such advertisement that appeared in a popular arts magazine. And this is actually the advertisement. And this is the advertisement of the villain of my book. I don't want to call him the hero of my book, Subhash Kapoor. And here he is advertising openly the sale of a Mount Abu Rajasthan marble Jean Tirthankara. And there are two such sales that he made. One is in Australia and one is in a prestigious university in America. Now, such objects are everywhere in India. So this is another site in Karnataka where you can see they're just on the road. Uh, this site is, uh, you know, you, you, you can just park your car right next to these. So what is the solution? For me, the solution is for a, a place that's so ancient. Uh, this is akin to uh, wildlife trafficking. When the buying stops, the looting will stop. And this is what we are working on parallelly. And a case in point is this beautiful ceiling damsel that was stolen by robbers sold currently with the Denver Museum. And for 30 years, we've been fighting with the museum to give it back. We finally managed to locate the black and white photograph. It's actually a photograph from the ASA archive. And uh, this is our work. So for, this is a documented antiquity. This is an, so this is our work. So this is the kind of meticulous detail into which every crack, every scratch 
from the original archive and this again shows the importance of archival images with this proof the Dedwa museum is refusing we gave this about four years ago uh, so we are not pushing enough we are not uh, you know forceful enough and now they are asking us show us the photo of the empty niche show us the dimensions of the empty niche so this is a battle so not all success stories i have a happy ending so far but i would like viewers collectors and the museum curators to see what by doing not returning rightfully what is due to us and also buying such stolen looted art it kindles the market and this is a case of a temple that is in karnataka was looted in 2014 october this temple is in a place called Kikere and it's actually end of the road and then the road leads to a lake. So through a village you drive through and in the midnight robbers entered the temple through this window that has since been <laughs> bolted up. So literally after the theft has happened, uh, so the administration has woken up and what happened was this. So what you're seeing is what all was looted, uh, broken. Uh, unspirited away and we managed to go down and meet uh, when we heard that that happened we managed to meet uh, the priests and we managed to collect the archival photographs and these images have not yet surfaced in the art market so we talked about fencing in the last session so collectors have very deep pockets so they basically don't bring it out for sale for a long time and these six beautiful ladies are missing for the last almost seven years uh, we're still watching the art market for this so by continuing to buy objects of art without proper paperwork the western market the dollar driven greed is actually denuding our sites worship so what do we do we as a team work on restitution which is a primary uh, job uh, we build awareness we act in deterrence because seeing the action a lot of people as you will see have voluntarily come forward and given up objects that they know it's stolen and uh, we also work on policy so you can actually see what uh, influencing policy means because for too long india has been uh, driven or rather misguided by the collecting lobby cabal into not creating very strong effective laws to combat heritage awareness we are also working with world customs and india customs on capacity building exercises so this is uh, in short our five point program that we do so we decided to be the change so i just show you a few examples of what we did and why we call it be the change here we are now looking at raising awareness as we go on trip stores uh, we work with school children uh, getting them introduced into art we also work with local collectives that encourage people to visit heritage sites because most often, for example, this was a site in Madurai that was actually tied this entire hill, which had a third century uh, before common era inscription was targeted by the granite mafia for quarrying. So the entire village turned up. Uh, so this was a trip that uh, we all made the climb. Uh, we had experts come and talk about the inscription and so many people there and uh, you know these are things that we do for awareness building uh, we as an organization don't collect even a single dollar as donations or any uh, subsidies from any organization or government we also don't take any money from our volunteers all we request our volunteers to do is to if they find a photograph uh, or old book or a uh, 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 catalog we ask them to scan it we ask them to buy the book keep the book with them send them the scanned image send us the scanned image if they find a museum having an indian object take a photograph take one photograph with them take one photograph without them send us the one without them so by what do we do with that we build an image archive at zero cost so we have facebook themed groups wherein you know we have shiva week vishnu week and then we go through prantaka week we have ardhanari week so we basically try to get these themed weeks so that over the last one and a half decades, we have basically built the most largest diverse collection of dispersed Indian art around the world and also all the books on Indian art and sculpture. Basically, then we have expanded using social media to report fines. We saw how in the last session, uh, buried hoards were not reported and they were smuggled out. And today people are 
actually tweeting to our handle as and when. So this is a buried bronze sword that was found. And this was inside the Srirangam temple. So people are immediately tweeting so that we document such finds. People are also reporting thefts. So they are reporting thefts, what is missing to us, uh, sometimes openly like this, sometimes confidentially. People are also buying catalogs. So we are going back to say 1990, 1980, these catalogs are expensive. Our volunteers are buying these catalogs and scanning them over for us. So we have built this knowledge base. What do we do with this knowledge base? We data mine this knowledge base. Give you an example. This beautiful uh, Soma Skanda, Shiva, Parvati and Skanda uh, is in a museum in Southeast Asia. This was actually documented in 1914 in a book. There was no other record. The only reference was this book of 1914 and the image that you see on the right. It says Sivan Kodal Somaskanda. There is nothing inside the book that refers to where this temple is. We managed to spot this. We use social media asking where is this place and one of our friend's drivers mentioned as a small village outside of Chennai. We managed to go there and we found that there was a ruined temple and now the temple has been taken over by ASI. We are now working on trying to get this image back. We are also writing on uh, we are leveraging social media. Uh, another classic case is this uh, beautiful uh, uh, Jain uh, Murti from Bihar and this was stolen. So the mutt reached out to us and we told them, do you have photographs? Is it documented? They said, yes. How, when was the theft? They said, tonight. It happened last night. We said, publish it in every paper. This is very, very important. When the thieves realized that it was a documented antiquity, they know it was unsellable in the international market. In three days time, they threw it in the nearest forest and ran away. Now, this is important. We cannot do this if after a few months, because by that time, the Moti is already spirited via Nepal, across the borders. Then the robbers will destroy the artifact because they risk exposure. If you can publicize steps immediately before they are moved across states, then the thieves know that it's worthless. They will throw it off. So one such example is this. I will try to make it interesting. I won't reveal. So this old photograph of a British excavation of a site called Chandavaram holds a vital clue which you will use later. So this is my book. Uh, not pitching for it. Plus, please, uh, if you have time, take a look at it. It's uh, also released in uh, different translations. We have Tamil, Marathi, Hindi and Malayalam as well. It talks about a very important figure in the art market we call Data Janus figure. Uh, Janus is a Greek god. He knows both the past and the future. So basically, this is the villain of the book, Subhash Kapoor. And the two bronzes behind them are very, are very important. So just keep this in memory. I'll explain to you why those two bronzes are important. And he was so blatant that he was actually directly remitting accounts, uh, objects uh, to his bank account. And this was his. So they were actually exporting our murtis, declaring them as garden furniture. And one such is this beautiful Jain Murti. And a farmer was actually digging his field to create a shrimp pond when he struck a metal object. He basically sold it for 5,000 rupees to a old paper mart. And from there, it landed up with a prominent supplier called Sanjeevi Ashokan. And then, uh, surprise of surprise, uh, it was displayed in the London Royal Academy of Arts as uh, a private exhibit. So when uh, Kapoor was arrested, we managed to get hold of his emails and this email trail actually shows why is it important that the government right now because of the uh, Treasure Trove Act of 1989. Sorry. Uh, so what's happening these days is if, if you find anything under the ground, it belongs to uh, the government. So anything over 10 rupees found underneath the ground belongs to the government. Now, we need to come up with a way of incentivizing finders. And they're not looking at big money. These are basically sold for the worth of metal. So if the government can come up with a way of honoring such people, you know, call them for Republic Day Parade or whenever it's displayed, put them for, you know, for reporting such. These small things can go a big way in stopping these. And what is interesting is the smugglers actually tested this artifact for antiquity. They sent it to a US institute and there you can actually see the scraping marks. And finally, uh, one of our own Lotus awardees uh, wrote flowery 
uh, catalog for this bronze and we're currently working on bringing it back. So this is another story just to say how thousands of our murtis are being spirited away. Uh, we'll see more such examples as we go ahead. Because what is interesting is we have been lax and today that's one such laxity is this case of 1970 wherein uh, it was the judgment was given only in 1992. Kapoor's father was actually charged with theft of a Vishnu idol when he was running an antique shop in Delhi. But because of the slow nature of our wheels of justice, by 1974, the entire family emigrated to America when there was a pending case in his name. So there you see. And then nothing happened. So this seems to be a family business for them. What is more atrocious is the case of this Nataraja. I call it the hand-cut Nataraja of Parur. Robbers basically thought the bronzes had gold. So technically we call them Ashtadhatu or Panchaloga. They have very, 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 very minuscule number of silver and gold. The percentages are like 0.002%. But the robbers thought they had gold. They actually sawed off the Nataraja's hand and melted it for gold. The jeweler who melted it came back and said, no, boy, there's no gold in it. They got into an argument and in 2005, the jeweler was killed in the argument. So there was a murder case. But surprise of surprises, this Nataraja appeared with his hand intact on Kapoor's catalog in New York, in Madison Avenue in 2007, March. How did it happen? Because it was smuggled away in a hand-cut state from Tamil Nadu via Orissa into Nepal. And it was spirited away. But what happened? How did it show out his hand again? It was done by a restorer in London. And this is again against every aspect of restoration. The restorer should one look at it. He knows it was sawed off. You can actually see the saw marks. But instead for money, he made it a new hand without reporting it to the police. But what is more interesting is Subhash Kapoor was arrested in September of 2011 in, via an Interpol red corner notice in Germany. A month before he was arrested, this Nataraja was quietly handed over to the Tamil Nadu police with his hand intact. So this Nataraja lost his hand, went on a world tour without a visa passport, came back and quietly given back to the Tamil Nadu police to close the case. We worked on it. We exposed this. The main supplier who would basically handed over was raided in 2016 June. This was his house. The raid that is how it happened in 2016. Over 400 artifacts were recovered from his house in the heart of Chennai. He was a prominent dealer, Dina Dayalan. And he had actually sold to a couple of others and their houses were raided. And you can actually see what all was raided from their houses. But what is interesting is when we worked on this case, we realized that the robbers were using social media. Unlike in the past where, you know, the dealers and auction houses used to send their representatives to India to look at objects. Because of social media, the robbers are actually sending like groom photos, prospective brides. They're sending it and dealers are bidding on these. And here you see two Varapalakas and on the Nataraja. That, this is the Nataraja that came back. We're going to talk about him. But on the right, you see the two, they are about nine and a half feet granite door guardians. And both of them were from a temple. And you actually see they put a dhoti behind it. And these were restituted last year in February from Australia. We can see about them. But then here you see a lungi, you know, uh, Balarama there uh, from Central India. And a lot of such are happening. So we managed to crack that this was a main modus operandi where robbers are using such robber photos. So we, I just thought I'll show you how we crack cases so that you can understand and how you can help us. So this is the first success that we talked about. The beautiful androgynous form of Shiva Ardhanari from Rudachalam. It's such a beautiful uh, composition that I studied this very image in 2008 when I blogged about it. So you can actually see when you match a male form and a, a lady form, the anatomical proportions are different. And so the uh, entire composition tilts to the man's side because the man is generally shown taller. And to balance that image, the sculptor brings in the Nandi so that the Lord rests his hand on it so that it come. Otherwise, it will be like he's built at a uh, bad angle.
now i spoke about 30 seconds more because you now you realize that both the hands of this beautiful sculpture are broken beauty of the sculpture is so great that unless somebody tells you that the lower left hand and the lower right hand are broken you don't realize it this was in fact in the temple in Vrudachalam as a Kosta Murti the robbers basically so that's the robber photo as soon as he was removed it was sold to the art gallery of new south wales the moment i saw this i knew it because i had blogged on it i had studied this image so we went again on social media within half an hour one of our friends we were expecting an empty niche we were surprised there was a fake put there and the fake was so badly made compared to the original that it i don't know how the locals were fooled for almost 13 years they were worshipping the fake so we managed to publish it and and it was so ridiculous the museum that brought it, the Art Gallery in New South Wales, actually had a book. So this uh, Ardhanaj was published by Douglas Barrett in his book on Chola Art. And this book was in the same museum's library. So much for the due diligence. And finally, this Murti was brought back by the Australian, Australian Premier and given it to our Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi. And there you see them on the right. Uh, we'll talk about the Nataraj as well. So this happened in 2014, the first of the restoration cases. So in the previous session, we talked about how India had got back 19 artifacts from 1972 to 2013. So this was the first thing that happened with the regime change. Uh, this was the first restitution that happened under the new government. So because of this, we managed to prove a lot of things. So this was the robber photos that were uh, accessed. Criminal complaint was lodged in the US as well. And what was interesting is the provenance information provided. So basically, Subhash Kapoor had girlfriends everywhere. So he had a girlfriend in Singapore. He had a girlfriend in the US. And they were used to fake provenances. And Australia was so pathetic in their, we call it optical due diligence. All the paperwork had the same name. Selina Mohammed, Abdullah Mehgu. And they basically used the same document for almost every object. So basically, nobody cared to check. They just put these objects. And one of these objects was actually auctioned publicly in the previous year in an auction house. So we'll go about each one of these cases. So what is interesting is uh, they also managed to obtain what is called the Art Loss Register Certificate. This is a for-profit company that is uh, based out of London. And what this company says is if you have lost any temple in India has lost uh, deity, you pay us a fee and register it. We, whenever an art market guy comes and checks, we will run a check in our database and give this certificate. So you know our temples, hardly any documentation exists and Interpol has this as a free service. Why would any temple pay uh, whatever is the pound value? And they don't have a database and they've been giving such certificates everywhere. With just this certificate, Australia bought. So this was the first institution which followed up. So from the same temple, this uh, Pratinkara Devi was also looted. We managed to get it back, uh, came back to Delhi. Uh, a lot of such cases happened. Uh, we had uh, the restitution cases. We also worked on another dealer, Vienna Galleries, from which this Buddha was stolen. Uh, this Buddha came back and we are also trying to work this interesting case. We talked about how we use the French University archives in the next case. But what is interesting is Australia is very, very choosy to what they return. So in this case, this is a beautiful bronze of a Shaivet Saint uh, Manika Vasala. It's a documented antiquity from a temple that was stolen in 1969, one year before the UN Stashfet of 1970. This was a book that they published, Shadow of the Gods, where our work is acknowledged. Uh, the, uh, the then French Premier, uh, Mr. And, and Prime Minister Modi, published this uh, book. And this book has this photograph when it was still in the temple. It is currently in Australia. Australia is refusing to give back this movie. Similarly, we also chance on this beautiful image via a German researcher who said, look, this is in Australia. It was actually in a centrally protected site in Chandavaram. We went and checked about it. What happened was in 2002, three times the same site was robbed. First, the robbers came, tied up the security guards, looted. Second time, three months later, the police were there. They tied up the police, looted. Fourth, third time they came, they did the same thing, threatened the police, looted. So this was like this inside the museum. The robbers actually, you can see this is the robber photo. They broke it into parts to enable and then got it stitched again. And it was sold to uh, for about uh, half a million dollars to the art, uh, to the uh, to Australian museum. 
with the same paperwork. So all these that you see are old uh, letterheads which Kapoor fabricated with the old typewriter. And he put a 1969-1970 date to fool the museum curators. And this was finally brought back uh, thanks to our German researcher friend. Uh, it's also come back. And here is the proof when I showed you there in the bottom in this photograph. You can actually see that this is was there uh, in the site in Chandavaram. What irked us was till we got back this Muthi was physically back in India. The Chandavaram people never told us what else was lost. So we managed to finally go and find out that they had lost many more. And one such was actually auctioned by another dealer uh, in uh, Christie's sale. And you can actually see the object uh, from the photograph. Another object was sold to the Lure Abu Dhabi, who, who are still refusing to give back. Uh, this is the one that is in Lure Abu Dhabi. More so, Zubash Kapoor, uh, we worked on, this was the main evidence. The two bronzes had inscribed bases. And what you see is old Tamil, which actually reads Sutta Valli, but because the village name is Sutta Malli now, over a thousand years, the village name had changed. We couldn't, uh, so if you read the book, you will know what troubles it cost us. But with this, we managed to ID the temple, the ID the village. Plus, uh, Kapoor had a fight with his girlfriend in uh, Singapore. They went to court and this also helped his downfall. Because what is important is the French Institute archive and this is was their archive before it was uh, digitized. So this was how we used to work. So you go there, you get thousands of these bin cards at this level in these boxes. You go through hundreds of them, try to find a match. And then once you found a match, this is what we do. We go and ask them for a high resolution photograph. We send our volunteers to the museum. This was the Nataraja documented by the French Institute when she was still inside the temple in Sri uh, The local custodian praying to an empty shrine from where he was stolen. The robber photo, the high resolution photograph. This is the catalog photograph. The Australian Museum had bought it for $5 million. The curator refused to accept that it was the same Nataraja. In fact, he went on public and said, there are hundreds of Natarajas. You cannot differentiate one from the other. You are mistaken. We said, you have made a mistake. This is made by the lost wax method. And instead of giving him the proof, we put the proof on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and Google for Return of the Dancer on my channel, you will see what evidence. So we managed to spot around 32 places where small nicks, cuts, breakages were matched. And then it was so obvious they had to return it. Uh, not only that, uh, the Nataraja went back to the village from where he was stolen. He was kept in the same place from where he was stolen. And more interestingly, this is how the villagers welcome the Lord back. The ruined temple was spruced up. They promised to take care of that. And the entire village turned up. In fact, I have some videos. If you have time, I can play uh, where the Lord was brought back in processions. <coughs> and what is interesting is bulk of them were shipped through normal shipping channels. Some of them were shipped as even LCL loads. That means not even in full container loads. Many more we are currently working on uh, similar objects. One such is this classic uh, Chola Buddha. What was interesting is this Buddha was in Kapoor's catalog. This is there he is when inside a temple in India, uh, you know, uh, it was the, the local cop said, no, we had safeguarded the deity. There was an article in Hindu actually which said, uh, prompt action by the cops have stopped the smugglers from exporting this, uh, smuggling this. In fact, when he was already in the US, and what is more interesting, he was actually loaned to the Singapore Museum for their uh, Nalanda Way uh, exhibition. He was opened by then Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh. So this Buddha was on display on an exhibition, stolen Buddha. And when it went back to the US, the price went up by another million dollars because he put a board saying it was on display in a museum opened by Indian Prime Minister. So there's a lot of things that our diplomats need to be careful about. They should not be creating good provenance. So in fact, this is the provenance letter provided for this Buddha by the same London, Inn, where they say provenance provided, not provided. And they're giving a provenance certificate saying this is not stolen. 
So we are also working on a lot of such cases. I talked about this. We are talking about robber photos. This was a robber photo. This is another Buddha. Uh, of course, uh, Gupta era Buddha that is in Singapore. We are trying to get him back. We managed to get this Uma uh, back from Singapore. Again, one of our volunteers spotted. We managed to get the catalog. We did some creative uh, work with the media. Husband back from Australia, wife stuck in Singapore. Uh, uh, Uma came back. We also worked on the Toledo uh, Ganesha, similar case, wherein there was a small casting uh, error. So you can see on the trunk, there's a small blemish. This was captured in the original archive. With that, we managed, so one of our volunteers again went and took a photograph. We managed to match them. And when we provided this evidence, the museum had no choice. But what they did later was surprising. Uh, they didn't reply to us. They wrote to the Indian uh, consulate. They did not get a response for six months. And they put this letter on their website. Later, they wrote to the Indian High Commission. They did not get a response for one year. Finally, they handed over this Ganesha to Homeland Security. And when our Prime Minister, Dr. Uh, Mr. Narendra Modi, went to the US in June of 2016, these idols were handed over. The Ganesha was handed over to Modi. And it was brought back to India, taken to the village again. And the people there, you see, are praying to it. Uh, just because we managed. What is interesting in this case is, Kapoor not only sold this Ganesha, he also donated over half a million worth of Chandraketu Gar terracotta images. So they were flat packed. So almost 90% were destroyed when they were couriered out of West Bengal. Not only that, he gave a cash donation of close to half. So this is how he is ingrating into the museum network. I'll give you a few more examples. This is. Uh, on context, this was another case where uh, there was a, uh, these were beautiful relief sculptures of the Pallava era, 8th century. The locals actually were building a new temple. They threw out these uh, murtis. One of our volunteers was going there. We went and made a big issue, uh, like a protest, and they actually erected a, a, a shed to safeguard this. As they were recording this, an old man was passing by. The the person who's constructing the temple was complaining that we're making him do much, so much work. The, the deities are safe, nothing can be stolen from the village. But this old man was passing by. He said, yeah, but 10 years ago, a murga was stolen from this place. Don't you know? Nobody heard it, but the camera heard it. So in the night when they sent me the video, I was hearing it. I managed to track it. We managed to send our people again next day. We found the old man. He said, yes, there was a skanda that was stolen. So it was not documented anywhere by anybody. So we managed a small WhatsApp group among the villagers. Then we found a dentist who had an old book. In that old book, in a small booklet, there was this small photograph of this Kanda before theft. Now what is interesting is Kapoor was trying to sell it as a Shiva of the Pandyan era. You know, the context was gone. And uh, we managed to track it with seized in the US. A lot of such cases, this is a Brahma stolen from another temple during a height of the Tane cyclone. So there was a big cyclone and there's actually a 10 feet perimeter wall of this temple. The guy basically managed to, this is a stone, almost a one ton sculpture. They managed to bring a truck and uh, they managed to, uh, we're still searching for this. Uh, we managed to find another one stolen from the temple, seized. So like this, even uh, we work on a lot of such uh, cases where we managed to track how big was the loot? Uh, just to give you an example, this is just Subhash Kapoor's storage locations. In 2012, Operation Hidden Idol was publicly published in the US. In 14 storage locations across New York alone, so I'm just going to show you photographs of what was seized. All these are seizures and catalogs. What you're seeing, I'm just running through what, 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 what all he had in storage. This is a endogangetic anthropomorphic form and an inner seal as well. And not the, not one yet, so many. So Operation Hidden ID yielded in 14 storage locations a total of 2,622 objects valued at $107 million, almost 850 crore rupees, was his holding stock, unsold stock. And he was in business for 35 years. So now you can imagine the size of this loot. We also worked on a several other cases. 
uh, then in 2016 itself, there was uh, Asia Week raids where $20 million worth of uh, looted stuff were found. We worked on this. Uh, so from robber photos, we helped match and Homeland Security managed to seize uh, these objects. A lot of such cases. Uh, we are now working on what is going to be the biggest restitution in the world. This $15 million Yakshi, uh, thanks Dr. Manfredi Kirat, Manfredi of Bombay, uh, who is one of our good friends. We managed to track this beautiful uh, Barhut Yakshi. It was a, a documented antiquity, but uh, a private antiquity. A farmer was using it as a Skola Devata. He registered it with the ASI, and then in 20, 2004, robbers actually broke into his house and stole the Yakshi. Not only that, they broke it into three parts for shipping, and then they used the Richard Solomon Restoration Services in the US to stitch it back. There he is stitching it back. And Kapoor had put it in the market for $15 million. She is now seized, but waiting to come back for the last nine years. She is in a warehouse in the US. So, yes, uh, archives are important, but it's very, very. So, this is a recent success of ours. Uh, Saint Trimangay Alwar, who is now in the Oxford Museum in Ashmolean, Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. The temple has a fake, the blue background is a fake, the original is what is documented uh, by the French Institute. So, Oxford has promised to give him back, but after the corona, they want to come to India and do it. But when you went to the temple and we saw that everything was fake, so all the other idols were also fake. So, I'll give you, can I take another five minutes, Ankur? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, please take your time. Okay. So I just thought I'll show you a couple of uh, success stories and actual modus operandi uh, because uh, so it's like 911 for gods. So this is an actual WhatsApp conversation with a confidential informant. So he's sending me at around 9 o'clock uh, images of missing. So we're discussing and then at around 10 o'clock, I confirm that, yeah, I have a match. Get me the details. So he's sending me the details when it was stolen. We know it is currently uh, in the US. Uh, this is a documented picture from the temple that he's sending me. It was stolen in 1972. And then we get to work. So this is now tracked to the Asia Society Museum. And this is the work that we do in terms of matching. You know, I talked about the breakages, how we ensure that it is the same icon. So this proof is submitted away. Uh, we also work on. <laughs> Similar, uh, this was uh, uh, Brahma Brahmani. Again, Dr. Mankuri put out a lookout notice. We managed to find it uh, in London, uh, put up by a dealer. We managed to match it, but ASI sent an expert to London, and the ASI expert said our match is not correct, and he returned the idol back. We worked and we fought, and we actually realized that he had made serious mistakes in his expert report. Uh, I want you to look at point number four. He says the Brahma's hand is broken in the image he's seeing in the in London, whereas in the original photograph, the finger is intact, which is very, very stupid argument. Obviously, when they smuggled it out of India, they broke the hand. So we managed to uh, bring it up to the authorities. And this was the uh, we had actually we do meticulous work. Every scratch, every dot, every crack we managed to match. So based on this, we wrote again to the DG and they uh, appointed an expert committee to review the expert's opinion. They accepted our opinion. And finally, this Brahma Brahmani came back to India. It is currently now in the restituted museum in Kuranakila. But of course, both my name and Dr. Fankuri's name consciously missing. But they credit the transporter who brought uh, the idol to the London High Commission for uh, experts view. Anyway, uh, we are not looking for that. So the last one, this was our uh, most important uh, success. Uh, how we solved uh, 1961 theft from the Nalanda Site Museum. In fact, we were not even looking for it. We were looking for this image. We managed to find it in an old YouTube video of a dealer who is discussing it in a Tefaf Masters show, which is like an art uh, sales week. We were looking for this and we also have a WhatsApp group of like-minded people you know, from Cambodia, Italy, Egypt, uh, Syria. So we just discussed. So whenever I find anything from their country, I'll send to them. Whenever they find Indian stuff, they'll send to me. So we're talking about it, trying to find it. Currently, the dealer 
doesn't remember. He told the, the Met police that he doesn't remember about they're still fighting on it. But what is interesting is uh, Dr. Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal, the principal economic advisor to the current Prime Minister Modi, uh, is a good friend. Uh, he was in Singapore. We used to discuss a lot of work. He's always been supportive. In fact, he launched my book in Delhi. He met a retired ASI director, uh, Dr. Bishwas. And Dr. Bishwas, uh, he was telling him about my work. And Dr. Bishwas said, can Vijay solve this step, no? like a challenge? Two thefts happened in 1961. 16 bronzes were missing from the Nalanda Site Museum. India knew about it. In fact, in 1977, we tried to get one from the LACMA, but there was no proof. But what was interesting is, Dr. Bishwas managed to find the old departmental note and he sent me or some of the photographs of the objects that are missing. And as I usually do, I print them out and put it on my wall. I commit them to memory for a couple of days before I pull them down. And one of our uh, volunteer uh, friends, uh, Linda Abbotson, who runs an art crime institute, uh, basically was going to Tefra. We come to that. We managed to give this detail uh, to the Indian High Commission in, um, in, in uh, ASIN. So we now have proof. So this is the object from the museum's records. This is currently on display in LACMA. So this is the matching, obviously, you know, it's straightforward fix. Uh, but it's been four years. Uh, we are still waiting for the LACMA to give back this bronze. What is interesting is uh, this is our exchange uh, on our group. And here we are talking about uh, you know Linda going to TEFF and I'm telling her a list of Indian dealers and on top of it she starts sending me photographs uh, you know from whatever she feels is Asian and then we go in uh, she sends me at 3 48 uh, in the morning a.m. and I say I have a match so from memory I know I've seen this uh, Buddha somewhere but as what is interesting is uh, the robbers basically had become very creative. What they had done is they had basically uh, inserted, uh, so they've broken a leaf from the left of the Buddha image and they had actually put it on the other side. So what is happening here is uh, we proving it. So this was the just, uh, missing object. Let's see if you can spot so here you see the leaf, the, the black and white is the old archival photo. So the leaf has been broken from the right and soldered to the left. And based on that, they disputed our claim that it is the same. Uh, we managed to get the ASI to uh, basically uh, write to the Met Police to go ahead and stop the sale and get this. ICOM basically sent their expert. And finally, on August 15th of 2018, this happened. Uh, the bronze was finally back, uh, given back, so we can look at that. Plus, we also managed uh, last year this brilliant uh, stuff that we talked about. Uh, this Rama Lakshman and Sita who came back, I talked about in the last session, but about a couple of months ago, I went there, and this is how uh, they are currently housed in the temple, uh, back to being the deities that they are. Uh, so a lot of these are the work in process. So for one of time, I just rushed through these cases. Uh, so thank you for your support and thanks for listening in patiently. Uh, if you want to see a, just a few minutes, I wanted to show a few uh, videos, but please, later maybe. Are we sure, okay? please, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, hold on a minute. So uh, I just, because last one was... Um, very uh, so I, I just wanted to end this on a positive note so of restitution of India's national cultural heritage a 12th century AD bronze image of Bhagavan Buddha this is an incredible story of a 900 year old cultural heritage that was stolen 57 years ago and is being returned back to India today this image was among the 14 bronze statues stolen from the Archaeological Survey of India Museum at Nalanda in August 1961. Earlier this year, the High Commission and the Met Police were alerted by Mr. Vijay Kumar of India Pride project about surfacing of this bronze. We look forward to continuing our strong relationship in the fight against crime.
so that's one uh, i just want to show one more uh, of honorable minister of culture and tourism government of india shri pralad singh patel ji her excellency the high commissioner of india to uk shrimati gayatri isha kumar detective chief inspector of london metropolitan service mr tim wright and other officers of mps shri k shanmugam chief secretary government of tamil nadu shri j k tripathi dg police tamil nadu shrimati b vidyavathi dg asr and other officials from tamil nadu government members of media ladies and gentlemen it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all for this very very special event we are extremely happy to announce that earlier today three very beautiful priceless 15th century items of sri rama sita and lakshmana were received by the high commission please uh, so this was actually uh, the actual ceremony is quite long i want to end with the last video promise i won't take more of your time so this is actually a video screen grab of So that was uh, Nataraja from Australia coming back after 1978, entering the village, and how the entire village uh, had turned up to welcome him back. On that note, I'd like to end this to say thanks for the support and Jai Hind. The gods have decided to come back. We are just the vehicles; they choose the time and period to come back. And thank you again. Uh, so I wanted to ask, like, so most of these uh, idols are they in museums? or are they in private possessions of i mean if they have been stolen so uh, are they in private possessions that we don't know like see um, most of them uh, there are this is all, all actually monetary crime involved as well in the us and australia for example if you donate an artifact to a museum you get tax breaks for the valuation for the museum it comes free but then to the donor he gets a tax break so this is another scam that is happening now uh, it used to happen in a much bigger way before they caught on to it in the us so what you do you engage a friendly valuer so basically you buy say for example for 8000 pounds keep it for 5 years and then you get a friendly valuer to value it at 200000 pounds because art valuation is arbitrary so unless you go and sell it you're not going to know what the price is so you donate a 200000 uh, pound artifact to a museum you get a tax break so you're a wealthy individual obviously you are you have you can use a ta tax break for 4 and 5 years so that's one it's also used to launder money so i would say that uh, we have more success when it's in a public museum because then uh, we can name and shame them uh, like australia now has passed a blanket rule that no public museum will buy a indian art object they've lost almost 14 million dollars so far and they're going to lose a couple of million more but uh, the sad part is the private sales happening and a lot of our smaller art objects so i would say that uh, our first target is at least public museums uh, are big consumers so as i said this is akin to wildlife when the buying stops the killing stops the looting stops so we are trying to work on that similarly we are also keeping watch of uh, our volunteers go for art market sales as you've seen so we are also looking at objects that are coming up for sale resale market uh we are looking at uh, private collections and exhibitions we are going after them but as i said uh, we are hobbyists at best so we hope that someday uh, indian government would realize the seriousness of this and try to set up a national art uh, arts squad